good morning class and welcome to chapter 10 part 2. Please as always have a periodic table, pen, pencil, calculator, scratch paper, and your pre-printed notes with you. And so we're going to start off with a little bit of review calculating KC again. So in example 4 the decomposition of dinitrogen tetroxide forms nitrogen dioxide as follows. One mole of dinitrogen tetroxide forms two moles of nitrogen dioxide. We want to know what is the numerical value of Kc at 100 degrees Celsius if a reaction mixture at equilibrium contains 0.45 molar N2O4 and 0.31 molar NO2. So remember that the Kc Kc is equal to a fraction with the products in the numerator, so the concentration of the NO2 raised to its coefficient, which is, you'll see here, a 2, so it's going to be NO2 squared, divided by the reactants, there's only one, N2O4, raised to the power of its coefficient, which in this case is 1. Remember that anything raised to the 1 power is just itself. So, this, let's put some numbers in here, would be NO2 is 0.31 molar, 0.31 squared, divided by 0.45. So let's see what we get here. 0.31 times 0.31. Now on these, you want to make sure to use parentheses particularly because you have things raised to various powers divided by other things. So we have 0.31 squared divided by 0.45. So I get a Kc of 0 0.214. The units on this one, we had moles up top, so we had moles times moles divided by moles. So one of each cancels, so the units on this one would be capital M. So 0.214 capital M, or molar. Let's try another one. We have a new reaction now. Hydrogen gas plus iodine gas gives 2HI, hydrogen iodide. What is the numerical value of Kc at 443 degrees Celsius if the equilibrium concentrations are as follows? The hydrogen gas is 1.2 molar, the iodine gas is 1.2 molar, and the HI is 0.35 molar. So again, Kc is equal to a fraction with the products on top. Products in this case are HI gas raised to the power of their coefficients, while the HI has a coefficient of 2, so that's squared, divided by the reactants, H2, each raised to the power of their coefficients. In this case, the coefficient is 1 and 1. Again, anything raised to the power of 1 is just itself. So H2, I2. So let's put some numbers in here. The HI is 1.2 squared. The H2, ooh, I made a mistake there. The HI is, is 0.35 molar. I read that wrong. Let's try that again. The HI is 0.35 molar squared. The H2 is 1.2. And the I2 is 1.2. So we have 0.35 squared. That's 0.1225. Divided by, again, making sure to use parentheses, 1.2 times 1.2 for a Kc value of 0 0.085. Uh, no units on this one because we have m times m divided by m times m. Right? The units on this are, are m and there's, it's squared, so m times m. And then the units on this are m and m. So that cancels and that cancels. There are no units on this. It's has no units at all. Okay, the values of Kc can be either large or small, and it really depends on whether equilibrium is reached with more products than reactants or more reactants than products. 
the size of Kc tells you nothing about how fast you got to equilibrium. Again, remember that this chapter is all about the speed of reactions. But the size of Kc, for instance, this Kc that we calculated up here is much larger than this Kc. But that doesn't tell you anything about how fast you got from your starting point to your equilibrium point. Instead, the size of Kc tells you whether you have more products or more reactants. If you have a large Kc, you have a large amount of products. If you have a small Kc, you have a small amount of products. So for example, the equilibrium constant for the reaction below has a large Kc. At equilibrium, the reaction mixture contains mostly products with only a little bit of reactants. So again, when you calculate Kc and you put the products in the numerator, and the reactants in the denominator, the larger the products, right, the larger the Kc. If you had a larger reactants, since those are in the denominator, you would have a smaller Kc. So it kind of makes sense, right? Large Kc, lots of products. Small Kc, few products. So there's actually a little bit, a little kind of graphic here that illustrates this, and it kind of shows you what we mean by large and small. So if Kc is around 1, if Kc is approximately equal to 1, that means that your reactants and products are roughly equal, meaning you have about the same amount of each. Any Kc larger than 1 means you start having more products. Kc is smaller than 1, meaning you have more reactants. So that's what we mean when we say small Kc, large Kc. If Kc is around 1, you're looking at roughly equal amounts. Anything above 1 and you're talking more products. Anything below 1 and you're talking more reactants. And again, this makes sense, right? If you look at the equilibrium constant of this one here, the N2 and O2 gas, which I believe, no, we didn't calculate this one. Um, we did one similar, though. The Kc of this is 2 times 10 to the negative 9. So that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I would say that's a pretty small Kc. This means that this reaction is mostly reactants, meaning it's mostly nitrogen and oxygen gas. It makes very little nitrogen monoxide. Okay, let's try another example. Example 6 says, for the reaction of carbon dioxide and hydrogen, the equilibrium concentrations are 0.25 molar carbon dioxide, 0 0.80 molar hydrogen gas, and 0 0.50 molar water. We want to know what is the equilibrium constant of carbon monoxide. And we're also given the Kc. Note that the Kc is less than 1. So this means that at equilibrium, we are going to have more reactants than products. So how does this work? The Kc is equal to, remember it's a fraction, with the products in the numerator, so CO and H2O, all raised to their coefficients, now, checking to make sure that this is a balanced equation, you have one carbon on the left, one carbon on the right, two oxygens on the left, one, two oxygens on the right, two hydrogens on the left, two hydrogens on the right. So these are all coefficients of one. So we don't have to raise anything to a power. On the bottom, we have CO2 and H2. So now, when we start putting in the things that we know, we know Kc this time. So 0 0.11 equals... We know the water, that's 0.5. We know, what else do we have? 0.25 carbon dioxide. Let's put that on the bottom. And what else do we have? 0 0.80 H2. So the only thing we're missing is the CO. And by the way, that question should say, what is the equilibrium concentration? Not constant. We have the equilibrium constant. That's this number right here. That should say, what is the equilibrium concentration of CO? So again, we have this equation here, and we have only one thing we don't know. That is the concentration of the CO. We know this concentration, this concentration, this concentration, and the Kc. So we can solve for the concentration of the CO. 
The first thing to do is to clear out the denominator on the right-hand side. You do that by multiplying both sides of the equation by whatever's in the denominator. So we have 0 0.11. We're going to multiply that by 0.25 to get it out of the denominator. And then we're going to multiply it by 0 0.80 to get that out of the denominator. At this point, I have 0 0.022 equals, we've gotten this out of the denominator, CO times 0 0.50. So now, to finish this up and to get rid of the 0 0.50, we're going to divide both sides by 0 0.50. Divide both sides by 0 0.50. So divide by... So now we get that the concentration of the carbon monoxide at equilibrium is 0 0.044 molar. Which, if we think about this, makes sense, right? Our Kc, again, is small. It's less than 1. Carbon monoxide is a product, right? Since we have a small Kc, we have mostly reactants, meaning you should have a low concentration of your products. Okay, let's try another one. Example 7 says, at equilibrium, the reaction below, PCl5 gas, decomposes to PCl3 and Cl2. We're given a Kc. We want to know, let's see here, if it has the concentrations where PCl3 and Cl2 are 0.1 molar, what is the concentration of the PCl5 at equilibrium? So again, our Kc is going to be equal to a fraction. This time we have two products, PCl3 and Cl2, and we only have one reactant, PCl5. So let's start sticking stuff in here that we know. We know Kc, we're given that, 4.2 times 10 to the negative 2. This is a small Kc, note the 10 to the negative 2. So we should have more what? Products or reactants. Well, small Kc, less than 1, we should have more reactants than products, meaning the number on the bottom should be larger. So let's see here. PCl3 and Cl2 were both 0 0.10 molar, so we have 0 0.10 and 0 0.10. On the bottom, we don't know. We have PCl5. That's what we're solving for. Okay, so how are we going to solve this equation? Again, we only have one thing we don't know, so it's algebra at this point. Since the PCL5 is in the denominator, we're going to need to multiply both sides by that to get it out. We need to get it out of the denominator. So we're going to end up with the concentration of PCL5 times the Kc, which is 4.2 times 10 to the negative 2, equals 0.1 times 0.1. Oops, let me just erase that real quick. Try that again. Point 0.1. Okay. So now, to solve this equation, it would be to get the Kc out of there, you would divide both sides by Kc. So the concentration of the PCL5 is going to be 0 0.1 times 0 0.1, which is 0 0.01, divided by the Kc, which is 4.2 times 10 to the negative 2, so I get a concentration of PCL5 of 0 0.238, 0 0.238 molar, which again, looking at the concentrations of the products at 0.1 and 0.1, this is what we expect to see, right? We expect to see this to be a larger concentration than our products since KC was small. Okay. So what happens when the conditions of a reaction at equilibrium are changed? Once that happens, then the forward and reverse reactions will no longer be equal. Okay. Le Chatelier's principle states that when a stress is placed on a reaction at equilibrium, the system responds by changing the rate of the forward or reverse reaction in the direction that relieves the stress and allows it to get back to equilibrium. So we always want to be at equilibrium. 
If you do something that takes us away from equilibrium, then the system is going to react in such a way as to try and get back there again. So, for example, if you have two tanks with water in them, like this tank here, tank A and tank B, if they're at equilibrium, meaning the amount of water in tank A is equal to the amount of water in tank B, what do you think would happen if we added water to tank A? Well, obviously, the water would flow through the connecting pipe until tank A and tank B are equal again. It's the same thing with a reaction, a chemical reaction. So for example, if you have hydrogen gas and iodide gas going back and forth to form 2HI, at equilibrium, the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are going at the same speed. But if you add some H2 to the mixture once it's at equilibrium, what will happen? Well, in order to get back to equilibrium and to relieve the stress, the reaction is going to head towards the products until it reaches equilibrium. So if more reactant is added, the rate of the forward reaction increases to form more product until the system is again at equilibrium. And the equilibrium shifts towards the products. So if you add something, you will shift. If you add a reactant, you will shift towards the products. If you add some products, say you added some HI to the system, then the reaction would shift in the other direction, right? creating more reactants until the system is at equilibrium. So whichever side you add on, the reaction shifts to the opposite direction. If you add reactants, you make more products, and you shift to the right. If you add products, you create more reactants, and you shift to the left. What happens if you add a catalyst? Remember, we talked about catalysts at the beginning of the chapter. So adding a catalyst speeds up a reaction by lowering the activation energy and increasing the rate of both the forward and the reverse reactions. So the time to reach equilibrium is shorter, but the ratios of reactants and products are not affected. So the addition of a catalyst does not change the equilibrium mixture. It changes the speed. And again, remember that the KC doesn't tell you anything about the speed. So what happens if we increase the volume? Well, a change in the volume of a gas mixture at equilibrium will change the concentration of the gases in the mixture. If you remember Avogadro's law, which related volumes and amounts, remember that if you increase the amount, you increase the volume. If you decrease the amount, you decrease the volume. Well, the same kind of effect is at play here. If you decrease the volume of a gas mixture at equilibrium, it will shift towards the side with the fewer moles of gas. Fewer moles. So how many moles of gas do we have on the left side of this equation versus the right side? On the left side, you have two moles of carbon monoxide and one mole of oxygen gas. So two plus one, you have a total of three moles. On the right-hand side, you have two moles of carbon dioxide. So if you decrease the volume we will shift our equilibrium towards the side with the fewer moles. What if you do the opposite? What if you increase the volume? Same thing, if you increase the volume, now you're going to head towards the side with the larger moles. Again, you're going to look at the coefficients on the left. You have two moles of carbon monoxide, one mole of oxygen gas, for a total of three moles. On the right-hand side, you have two moles of carbon dioxide. So if you increase the volume, you would shift towards the reactants, right, or the side with more moles. So again, when you're looking at Le Chatelier's principle and you're looking at gases, you are always going to look, if you're changing volume, you're going to look for who has more moles or fewer moles, depending on whether you increase the volume or decrease the volume. How about temperature? What sort of effect do we think that temperature might have? Well, temperature really depends on whether we have an endothermic or an exothermic reaction. Hopefully you remember that an exothermic reaction is a reaction in which heat is given off. So heat, we could say, is a product in an exothermic reaction. 
In an endothermic reaction, you have to put heat in in order to make it go. So heat is a reactant. So in an endothermic reaction, heat is a reactant, meaning it's on the left-hand side of the arrow. If you were to decrease the temperature, so we're decreasing the temperature of an endothermic reaction, this causes the system to respond by shifting the reaction towards more heat. So therefore, it shifts the reaction towards the reactants, right? Heat is a reactant. So if you decrease the temperature over here, right, it is going to shift towards where the more heat is. What if you had an exothermic reaction? Right? In that case, the heat would be on the other side. Oops, I was writing exo. I meant to write heat. So in an exothermic reaction, the heat would be on the right-hand side. So again, if you decrease the temperature, you're going to head towards more heat. So in an exothermic reaction, you would, in, you would shift to the right, increase the products. In an endothermic reaction, if you decrease the temperature, you shift towards the reactants. So again, endothermic and exothermic, it really depends, right? Increasing and decreasing temperature, you really have to look at what kind of a reaction you're dealing with. Okay, what kind of a reaction are we dealing with? Because if it's exothermic, the heat is a product of the reaction. If it's endothermic, the heat is a reactant. So where the heat goes, whether it's on the left side of the reaction or over here on the right side of the reaction, really depends on what kind of a reaction you have and whether you increase the temperature or decrease the temperature. So that one can be kind of tricky. Volume is easy. Volume always shifts towards the side of more or fewer moles, right? So that is easy. You don't have to, all you have to do is count the number of moles. Heat's a little bit, again, a little bit, takes a little bit more thinking to figure out. So that's it. This concludes chapter 10. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope to see you guys back for chapter 11.